I'm Jim Haskell, editor of the Bridgewater Daily Observations. China is one of the most important drivers of the global economy, but also one of the most difficult economies for outsiders to understand. And yet, because of China's importance, it is essential for investors to recognize what its policymakers are trying to achieve and what they're not trying to achieve. Today, we're pleased to bring you a podcast from a recent conversation between Director of Investment Research, Rebecca Patterson, and former Australian Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, that focuses on understanding China, its goals, and how recent policies connect to those goals. Kevin served as Prime Minister from 2007 through 2010, and then briefly again in 2013. And he served as Foreign Minister from 2010 to 2012. He is now the president of the Asia Society Policy Institute and is a deeply knowledgeable China expert who speaks Mandarin fluently. This conversation covers recent regulatory moves involving China's tech giants, China's current cyclical conditions, how policymakers are approaching economic policy more broadly, and many other topics. We hope you enjoy the conversation. Kevin, thank you so much for being here. I'd like to start the conversation by putting China's recent regulatory announcements in some context. Obviously, Bridgewater watches China very closely. So does Ray Dalio, our founder. He's been going to China now for, gosh, several decades. Our simple working assumption is that Chinese leaders set long-term goals, and then they act in accordance with those goals. Ray sometimes describes it, describes it like a sailboat that has a destination in mind, but from time to time has to tack as the winds change. Now, because China's system operates differently from many Western systems, sometimes these tacks, if you will, they get misunderstood by Western observers. And, and maybe they're not always articulated in a way that's clear to everyone. But China is clear about its goals, which include continuing to develop its capital markets and opening a foreign investment. So I guess, Kevin, the question I have is, as you look at the recent regulatory announcements out of China, including those around DD and, and financial, what are your key takeaways? What goals do you think China has in mind as it takes these steps? Well, these are purely personal reflections and in the last 12 months captured with a degree of difficulty because I've been unable to travel to China. And so therefore the candor that we can have this conversation with here is not readily captured by the candor that you can have with um, Zoom conversations uh, in Beijing at present. So that's my caveat. But what are my two... Um, uh, so if we look at the two major recent case studies, uh, and Financial and Didi, um, I think, number one, there has been an active um, uh, determination on the part of Xi Jinping to send a clarion clear message to the country's uh, biggest um, uh, private conglomerates that the party rules China and they do not. That is a macro political message to the system. And that comes off the back of having read, you know, a hundred statements in my own case from Xi Jinping over the last seven or eight years about where he's taking the status of the party within the economy relative to his predecessors, which is a much, much stronger role. His predecessors were much more relaxed about this uh, rampant billionaire class. As Ray would remember, uh, Jiang Zemin, for example, came up with the extraordinary, as it were, ideological innovation that not, not only did Deng say to be rich is to be glorious, uh, Jiang Zemin said, once you become gloriously rich, we're going to welcome you into the ranks of the Communist Party. And that's how we're going to overcome this ideological contradiction. Well, that all happened, except that by the time you get through Hu Jintao to Xi Jinping, uh, he says there are two problems with that. One is rising corruption. Uh, and the second is alternative, as it were, models, political models uh, within this one party state where... Uh, the country and young people look at the, the country's biggest entrepreneurs as their role models for the future, rather than, as it were, political and ideological leaders. So that's one factor. The second, I think, in the case of the tech platforms is a, uh, a deeply felt concern about the control of data. Um, and these things are not um, mutually exclusive sets of considerations. And on the control of data question, um, given the um, heightening um, sensitivity 
at a strategic level between China and the United States, but also the particular concerns of the Chinese system as it relates to data security and what um, uh, Alibaba has within its uh, remit and what Didi, given the nature of its operations, has within its remit and under its control. Um, they are deeply concerned about, this is the Chinese, um, shall we say, data management authorities, about the free flow of that data around the world. Um, and I have seen that replicated at more micro levels. For example, if you're dealing with uh, the uh, Chinese um, biotechnology sector and even the uh, outflow of Chinese uh, genomic data uh, to the rest of the world, even though we would think that this would contribute to global medical research, et cetera. So there is a data concern, not in terms of privacy, as you can understand, but data in terms of state security. That is the second set of concerns. Um, I think the third, as it relates um, not to um, um, ant financial so much um, as it does to uh, Didi, where the signaling to Didi privately, as I best understand it, was do not proceed with a New York Stock Exchange listing. Um, consider, please, the alternative of Hong Kong. Um, but uh, that was um, ignored. What was the basis of that? I think at a very much at a, a uh, macro political level, it was a concern that given the various statements coming out of the United States in the last year or two about, shall we say, regulatory compliance, which would be insisted upon by the United States Congress through the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission, through to the Stock Exchange, on not just, as it were, um, audit uh, compliance, uh, but also a range of other uh, compliance factors and thereby from the Chinese perspective and the political party's perspective, making these firms much more vulnerable uh, to, um, shall we say, US political leverage uh, once they are, as it were, New York Stock Exchange listed into the future. And the macro message within that, and I'll conclude on this, is I think an, an increasing expectation and uh, soft shoe shuffle direction uh, to Chinese firms that if you're listing in the future, uh, if you wanted, if you, if you're, um, if it's, uh, um, uh, if it's possible, do it in Shanghai. If it's not, do it in Hong Kong. And if it's not possible in Hong Kong, let's talk about it. But, but the New York is not a viable option for the future. Those are the three sets of considerations that I've been picking up. I'd like to stay on this for another moment. You know, Chinese markets seem to be responding to changes in underlying economic fun fundamentals, just like we'd expect. If we take a balanced portfolio of Chinese stocks and bonds, for example, we have seen positive year-to-date returns. Still, local stocks have taken a big hit year-to-date and made a lot of front-page headlines. How do you think China's leadership thinks about those short-term implications of policy decisions? Uh, Xi Jinping, for a range of political economy reasons, is willing to tolerate uh, shorter term economic pain for longer term economic resilience. I think a lesson not really quite understood in Washington at present is as follows. When there's a theoretical debate in Washington about, hey guys, should we be, de be decoupling from the Chinese economy or not? Um, and should, de should decoupling happen? And if so, in which areas? Is it trade? Is it technology? Is it capital flows? Is it FDI? Is it whatever? Is it talent markets, etc.? cetera? Um, there is, dare I say, an arrogant assumption in Washington that the levers lie exclusively with the United States here on the question of decoupling. Xi Jinping, in my judgment, from about <clears throat> 2019, in a critical meeting of the Politburo in about June, July of that year, uh, when he said in an unreported speech that uh, the Americans uh, are about to become systemically provocative towards us for the next 30 years. From about that time, you begin to see the emergence of Xi Jinping's, uh, shall we say, formulation of what's called the dual circulation economy model or the, the new development model for China which essentially is one which is a growth model increasingly driven by domestic consumption, 
um, and rather than one which would be driven uh, long term uh, by a continuing robust assumptions about the state of net exports, even though exports continue to do well, as you would know from the, uh, the data most recently available. In other words, uh, a series of decisions which Xi Jinping is taking both on the grounds of his dual circulation economy model, domestically driven um, primarily, um, secondly, to increase another one of his catchphrases, uh, national economic self-reliance, Zili um, Gengsheng, so that if in the near future or the medium term future, uh, the United States under a government of whichever uh, political party in Washington that was to pull the lever against on significant further decoupling, that the damage at that stage would be much less and much more controllable if China has taken a range of other measures in the meantime whether it is on their own management of their own supply chains, whether it's their own level of exposure, for example, to international listings, whether it's their own exposure, for example, to international technology markets, hence the extraordinary levels of state investment effort currently going into the semiconductor business. I think that is a very, very big factor. One final set of considerations in terms of, let's call it the political economy factor, which would cause uh, Xi Jinping to accept um, a lower growth rate as a necessary economic uh, cost for a political gain is as follows. Xi Jinping is seeking to make China a somewhat more equitable country with more equitable income distribution over time. Not massive, not huge, uh, but also bearing in mind, I think part of the critique of the billionaire class um, what he is seeking to do uh, is to be able to uh, run an argument domestically and politically as a Marxist that there is a greater prospect in China over time of what he calls common prosperity. And therefore, if that means that you're going to have to be more redistributive than in the past, then that also becomes an economic price which he's prepared to pay for a political dividend, given the Marxist framework within which he ultimately would operate. I think for those two reasons, that he's more willing to accept a somewhat um, slower growth rate, if it turns out that way, than has been historically our assumption around the magical number called six. So we all know China led the world out of the pandemic last year, but recent quarters have seen growth moderating and policy is becoming a bit more neutral than it had been previously. Our take is that Chinese leaders act in accordance with their goals, which as they articulated this spring includes maintaining quote unquote continuity, stability and sustainability of macro policies and, and also implementing so-called prudent monetary policy. Now in that light, the recent reserve requirement ratio cut or triple R cut that was likely more of a fine tuning move rather than something that signals the start of a broader easing cycle. A broader easing cycle would be at odds with policymakers stated goals. So I'd be curious, Kevin, given how closely you watch China, do you agree that they're more in a neutral place today and they're just trying to keep things steady as she goes? Or do you see that differently? Yeah, I think your broad characterization about fine tuning is about right. As you know, with China, it's never pure economy, it's always political economy. And it's always important for us to bear that in mind acutely in dealing with the way in which central policy settings are taken. It's, um, and that's because I think the People's Bank of China and the finance ministry are not as robustly independent uh, as they were under the previous uh, reg uh, regime prior to Xi Jinping. But having said that, uh, I think you are, are right to say that um, uh, we have, I think, a, um, um, a, a move which doesn't point to a, a general easing uh, over time. I think it's uh, an interim set of measures. But what, what is bearing, I think, on the mind of the, uh, uh, both the PBOC, the finance ministry and the regime at a political level is two considerations. Uh, one is they do not have a model to understand how the macro decisions they've taken in relation to both and financial and DD 
uh, are actually translating through in terms of domestic business confidence, um, and not just from the billionaire class, but from the sub-billionaire class as well. It's very difficult to actually model that because it's frankly a set of circumstances which hasn't arisen like this in the post-1978 period. We have taken two quite considered decisions uh, against two of the largest corporations in the, in the country and with unknown consequences of how that will filter through to domestic market sentiment and domestic levels of business confidence. That's one uncertainty. And then, of course, um, you've got the um, uh, other uncertainty in terms of uh, growth levels uh, because of what's currently happening with um, uh, the impact of global commodity prices and the wash through impact of that. Uh, that I think is a second set of objective considerations. And the third, and I think hence the, uh, the triple R move uh, is because of some concerns uh, with um, obviously directly with bank liquidity as it relates to uh, SME credit um, at the other end of the economy. I think it's a cocktail of those three factors. But I think if I look at the broader statements by both the Kachung and the Premier uh, and by Yi Gang, the Governor, uh, stridently against any what we describe as capital F fiscal stimulus, um, I think it's important to see this as, as it were, um, a, um, um, uh, an interim measure rather than the indication of a general long-term easing. If we think about how policy feeds through to economies in countries like the United States, corporate confidence can have a huge influence on expectations for things like capital expenditures and investment. Confidence at the end of the day can be a real driver of the actual economy. Do you think that same thing holds true or at least increasingly holds true in China that you need to understand corporate confidence and corporate sentiment to know where China's economy is going? Yeah, well, certainly the um, Chinese uh, preferred management style is, um, is um, as it were, still centrally, uh, uh, centrally driven. Uh, Xi Jinping has this marvelous phrase, which is called a ding tong shi ji, which is kind of like engineering from above. Um, and uh, it is a phrase which has been reintroduced into or introduced in the Chinese macroeconomic policy lexicon uh, probably only in the last couple of years. But in practical terms, why does business confidence matter in China? I think it's along these terms. Uh, if you take um, the simple calculus of GDP and 60% uh, of it comes from, let's call it what's called the uh, the uh, well, meaning chair, which is the effectively the private sector, forty percent from SOEs. The only part of the economy, therefore, that the state can fully direct is that forty percent. And whereas there has been a revalidation of the role of SOEs in the Chinese economy under Xi Jinping, compared with where his predecessors wanted to take them, which is a, to a further lessening in their overall economic uh, influence. Uh, and then secondly, with a much more vigorous market-based reform agenda for each of them. Uh, the fact is um, that at 40% now, um, they um, are still not going to generate um, the bulk of new economic activity, the bulk of new employment activity, the bulk of new innovation, the bulk of new taxation generation. So therefore, um, what we would call um, the business sentiment index in uh, Western liberal capitalist economies is a real factor. Third point is that, however, the data which is produced on this, obviously in China, is going to be questionable. Um, uh, because if you have 60% of the economy saying, we think Xi Jinping's attack on Didi stinks, uh, and that has really affected our business confidence index, they're not gonna publish it. Um, but I know, and I'm sure those of you who deal with, um, uh, most particularly Ray, with the most senior Chinese chief executives of their own private firms, they are deeply observant of what is happening in the private marketplace in China, what's happening in the regulatory environment, what's happening in the political environment, what's happening in the anti-corruption environment, uh, 
um, and, uh, and what the expectations or policy expectations of the state are. Um, but that does not mean that they are therefore totally captive by the state. They make huge discretionary decisions. And many have said to me in recent times, I'm uncertain, therefore I'm not taking any big domestic um, uh, uh, decisions in terms of further expansion necessarily. Final point on that equation, though, and we can get into this in the later conversation, is that when you put this point to Chinese economic regulators, they will say, yeah, we get it that the billionaire class is unhappy. We understand that because of what's been happening with uh, Ant and what's happening with Tencent, what's happening with Didi, what's happening with the major tech platforms. Um, but for every um, uh, dozen billionaires, we have 10 dozen uh, multi-millionaires who want to become billionaires. And they're out there trying hard, working hard, investing, earning, um, innovating, and doing all sorts of new things. And so the thesis I get back from the regulators when I put to them this thesis that you are actually having an impact on the, the business sentiment index of the largest firms is, yep, we get that. There's a whole new tranche of firms emerging in these sectors uh, where confidence is reigning supreme. How do you produce that as a mathematical model? There is none. Along those lines, Kevin, the recent Chinese policy decision around making after-school tutoring firms not-for-profit seems focused at another goal as well, which is just making it easier, cheaper for families to have more children. And that goes back to China's long-term goals. We, you need productivity. We're getting that through technology in China, but you also need labor to reach your growth goals. Do you think that China's actions around making it easier for Chinese families to have kids, is that going to be successful? How much will it matter? There are very few jurisdictions which have engineered this policy shift. Look at the rest of Confucian Northeast Asia. Um, and where you have in Confucian Northeast Asia, in Japan and in Korea and in China, countries with negligible migration rates in for a whole range of other reasons, then it's not offsetting these challenges in terms of the natural birth rate. How do we offset it in our countries like the United States in a normal season through high levels of migration, like in my country? So the policy instruments I've introduced, for example, as prime minister on, I doubled, for example, the childcare tax rebate for families. Um, I brought in um, uh, a, a reasonable paid parental leave scheme. Uh, if I was to trace through the actual impact on the natural birth rate, negligible. That's just my honest answer. But we're 25 million people as opposed to 1.4 billion in a country with 3,000 years of accumulated social, as it were, conditioning on these questions. Kevin, you just mentioned the United States. I'd like to go back to China's relationship with the U.S. You made some really interesting points there. And, and there's a meeting that was happening recently outside of Beijing between U.S. and Chinese officials. The tone from what I've heard so far feels relatively hawkish. China had a list of red line items and then things that it would like the U.S. to do. You know, as I look ahead, I'm wondering, is there any area of common ground here for the two countries? If, if you break down issues into buckets, you know, you have collaboration and then you have areas where we don't agree. Maybe we call that the, the bucket of conflict. When I think about where we could see collaboration or cooperation, one low hanging fruit to me seems to be climate. And we have that very important global climate conference coming up this November. Could that be an issue that allows for greater collaboration or, or do you think it's just gonna be compartmentalized and other issues continue to get bipartisan US support for a hawkish stance towards China? Rebecca, you just referred a moment ago to this uh, meeting between Wendy Sherman, right. Deputy Secretary of State, and uh, Wang Yi, uh, the um, Chinese foreign minister in Tianjin. Um, I've just been looking at the statement um, put out by the Chinese foreign ministry spokesman, Zhao Li Jian. Uh, and you're right, if I read this thing through, it's <laughs> what the Chinese foreign ministry put out is one, a list of error corrections to be made by the United States. And the second is a list of key cases to be resolved by the United States. Uh, without going through these in, in a lot of detail. Um, if you're in the business of active problem solving between the two sides, you would not be putting out public lists of errors to be corrected by the United States 
or cases uh, involving individuals uh, to be uh, resolved um, by the American side. That seems to me to be put out by the Chinese side largely for domestic sort of consumption within China, uh, with the intention of demonstrating to the Chinese leadership and the Chinese body politic, and through them in a nationalist environment to the Chinese people, we're not about to be pushed around by the, by the Americans. Thank you very much. Here are our list of demands, bang. Uh, we've communicated that to the uh, US Deputy Secretary of State, bang. Uh, we've achieved negligible progress. Well, are we also, any of us surprised by that? So I'm, uh, if I'm looking at this, unless there is something being transacted uh, beneath the surface, um, at the same time as uh, these uh, statements are being exchanged, it would strike to me as a continuation of let's call it the spirit of Anchorage, Alaska, uh, which was um, not an entirely felicitous spirit if we reflect back on it. So therefore, I would think that this meeting, rather than representing as it were a scaling down in the uh, uh, aggravated tone of the relationship, is a continuation of where we've been for the last six months. On the future and the categorizations that you spoke about and uh, what I've sought to conceptualize in some of the writing that I've done within the framework of managed strategic competition and using guardrails uh, around, let's call it strategic red lines, so that uh, if we have a highly competitive relationship, we have a lesser risk of those escalating into crisis, conflict and war. The only encouraging thing I can say is that when I look at Wendy Sherman's language, she seems now to be incorporating more of that language of managed strategic competition than before on behalf of the administration. I also noticed that on the Chinese side, whether it's through Wang Yi, to lesser extent through Yang Jie uh, who's the Politburo member responsible, also um, a predisposition to talk about as it were, the impossible to solve questions, the highly competitive questions, and let's call it the collaboration and coexistence questions. This is where I've been trying to engineer the strategic framework for this crazy relationship between these 2,000 pound gorillas for some years. Um, that's you, you and the Chinese. Um, in terms of a, a framework within which to conduct each of those boxes, uh, whether I succeed on that score or others succeed on that score, I have no idea, but I do see some evidence of modest traction. Finally, um, on the question of where the collaboration lies, I think um, uh, the climate change channel is open. It is working to some extent, but compared with a month ago, it's now under political pressure. Um, the first six months of the administration, it was actually functioning better on the climate track than I think it has been for the last month or so. And that's in part based on our discussions with both the American side and with the Chinese side, because as an institution, we, the Asian Society, do a large second track exercise between the Chinese and the US over the last year and a half now on a climate change collaboration leading up to Glasgow which is the conference you referred to this November. In other areas of collaboration though, I think there is one positive thing to point out. And that is, I think if you look at the Paris Club collaboration with the Chinese uh, financial authorities over the question of um, sovereign debt uh, around the world, what I do see uh, is some advance on where we were even three months ago, that the Chinese do not wish to trigger their own or trigger a, a, a international financial crisis on the back of, of, of a failure for uh, their own reasons uh, to uh, not reschedule somebody's debt. So what has been, I think, a series of uh, furtive discussions within Financial Stability Board, uh, the Basel Committee, uh, with the Paris Club, involving the IMF, um, and I know that because I sit on the International Advisory um, Board of the, uh, the IMF uh, Managing Director, uh, Kristalina Georgieva, uh, that they are, there is more collaboration happening on the sovereign debt question uh, than meets the eye publicly. So I think that's the second and profitable area. Beyond those two, it is very difficult, however, 
to point to any other major substantive area uh, of, shall we say, a positive outcome between the two sides of the stage. You mentioned Paris Club and debt, and that makes me think of Belt and Road. I wondered, Kevin, what are your thoughts on that topic? Is China looking in Belt and Road differently? Has it learned lessons from some of the interactions they've had so far with different countries, maybe around politics or debt repayments? Where do you think they're going with this? Yeah, I think there is some um, reappraisal of Belt and Road at three levels. One is quantum. Uh, the second is um, uh, um, debt exposure. And the third is um, uh, carbon intensity. Um, and each of these has been subjected to considerable analysis within the Chinese system. And if uh, you or any of your colleagues are interested in work, which we, the Asia Society, have done on this in recent times, Danny Russell, my vice president, formerly Assistant Secretary of State East Asia in Washington under Obama, and his team have done recently a one and I think a second report on progress in the BRI so far. We've got another one coming out soon. Um, on the quantum, the um, no one will give you a definitive answer on this. And in fact, if you seek to go to any of the BRI websites in the Chinese system, or to go to the relevant ministries, none of them will tell you how much they've currently got invested uh, by one means or another. Uh, this is uh, a deep, dark national secret at this stage. Uh, but what we do know from our in informal engagement with the system uh, is that there has been a um, uh, come to Jesus moment, uh, let's call it a come to Marx moment, where they have um, worked out that guess what, um, uh, you end up <clears throat> with a lot of bad debt. Um, and it's not just the Venezuelan experience, but it's Venezuela plus. And so as a consequence of that, there is a predisposition in Beijing not to, as it were, can the BRI, they can't do that for political reasons. It's a Xi Jinping initiative and therefore by definition it is right. Um, but we should be, as it were, prepared for them to in financial quantum scale it back over time. Um, and within that, um, a move we predict, we don't have full evidence for this yet, uh, a move from the continued provision of hard physical infrastructure to instead the narrower provision of digital infrastructure across the BRI countries in order to underpin what where China sees itself as having a massive natural strength which is the uh, rollout uh, of its own uh, digital economy model, its own uh, e-commerce uh, ecosystem uh, anchored into its own um, financial platforms as well. In other words, a transformation from physical to digital infrastructure over time and with a less intensity of the quantum of financial investment. The second point uh, that we, uh, where you'll see some revision, I think, is from the aggregation of the debt learnings. Um, and uh, Venezuela has been a huge uh, internal controversy within the Chinese system, where you have this classic mix between you know, geopolitics and pure finance, um, and where everyone's trying to blame everybody else for how do we get ourselves into this mess with such a huge exposure to the Venezuelans. Um, and we all know uh, what China has got in terms of its, um, uh, its um, uh, as it were, equity equivalent out of that in terms of long-term uh, secured um, oil contracts out of, out of Venezuela. But this, I think, has also caused a rethink about the quantum of uh, debt uh, to be accumulated over time. The third one, which I think is big, and it is a huge debate being held right now, is between the Ministry of um, uh, the Environment um, and the National Development and Reform Commission uh, and the National Security and Foreign Policy Establishment over the extent to which the future of the BRI should be carbon neutral or not, given that many of the investments so far, particularly in Pakistan, but elsewhere as well, have actually added uh, carbon intensive projects like new coal mines, new coal fired power stations, uh, 
Uh, and the big debate not yet resolved is whether it should become fully renewable. And this is part of a final point, a much bigger debate in China itself, given the enormous success the Chinese have had through industry policy with cornering uh, a lot of the renewable energy technology and manufacturing market themselves, and not just wind turbines, not just solar panels and the, the next uh, solar storage capabilities, but across the board to turn themselves into the renewable energy equivalent of OPEC uh, for the future. Um, will that succeed or not? Don't know, but it's an active policy discussion within China at present. I think those three big, as it were, reconsiderations are um, evidenced within China now. The point you made on using a digital belt and road, it, that's interesting, especially in light of the back and forth going on between the party and some of the country's large tech companies right now. It also, though, makes me think about China's digital currency or CBDC and how that might play a part in all this. It, it seems from our perspective right now that China is pushing fast on having a digital sovereign currency primarily for retail domestic use. Our sense is that cross-border use will be a second stage. But when you talk about a digital belt and road, you could see that as a way for China to use a digital renminbi in a cross-border way. Maybe part of making the currency even more internationalized than it is today. What do you think? Certainly, as, as you know better than I, given the nature of your business, and given, for example, Ray's enormous experience in this area, um, the internationalization of the RMB writ large has been an ambition of the Chinese leadership for at least the last 15 years uh, and probably longer. Um, it's been manifest in different ways. Um, early debates about actually floating the exchange rate um, and then based on the cumulative experience, learnings and perceptions of the Asian financial crisis of 23 years ago saying, um, no way, Jose, uh, look what happened in Malaysia, look what happened elsewhere. We're not gonna make ourselves vulnerable uh, to George Soros Incorporated, thank you very much. So there's that, that whole basket of, shall we say, um, policy aspirations, but policy temperings coming out of that period. Secondly, as you know, you had bilateral currency swaps, um, and that is um, uh, the uh, bilateral um, uh, currency uh, uh, arrangements to finance trade without the intermediation of the US dollar, um, I think with about 32 different countries now. But if you look at the aggregation of all of those uh, bilateral uh, uh, currency arrangements, to fund trade without dollar intermediation, they still add up to a relatively small proportion of global trade, which still remains overwhelmingly denominated in US dollars. Um, then of course you go to um, the success which China has had uh, in terms of um, the, let's call it the perceived global status of the renminbi um, by its inclusion in the uh, IMF SDRs. Um, that's all been part of the, um, the overall, as it were, perception game and in part the reality game. Then we move on to element four of the strategy, which is what we've just discussing, which is the digital R&D. Um, as you've correctly said, uh, primarily uh, for use domestically in China's burgeoning uh, digital uh, commerce market. Look at how successful until the end of last year, uh, Alibaba uh, had been uh, across the board and continues to be. Um, uh, but uh, also with a weather uh, eye on how this can be rolled out internationally as well. Uh, I think you will see increasing uh, attempts to, as it were, trial out in and around the Winter Olympics, as you would have seen reported in various places and with various individual countries. What's my own bottom line on internationalization? Um, I'm not a financial, I'm not a Forex uh, expert at all. I'm a graduate in Tang and Sung poetry. Um, that's where I have my expertise. So you guys are seriously enumerate. You know what you're talking about. But I know enough about the way in which our Chinese friends think that they will go to full liberalization of the capital account 
when they believe that they are big enough and ugly enough not to be rolled over by the United States and or any of their allies acting in partnership with them in politically driven financial sanctions in the future or other actions which could be taken punitively if its capital markets were fully opened uh, to the rest of the world, or its capital account was fully opened to the rest of the world. Um, and that I believe is frankly one of the big psychological factors in the mind of the Chinese leadership. And when we often say the relative size of the Chinese economy and GDP measured market exchange rates against the United States economy doesn't matter in real economic terms, my own judgment is that in Chinese domestic political perception terms, it does. Because once that Rubicon is crossed um, and some point beyond it, when exactly, it's hard to pinpoint, the Chinese will in their own domestic political perception have sufficient self-confidence to take this risk, uh, which is uh, to um, uh, liberalise uh, the exchange rate, open uh, the, uh, the capital account, and then we're into a brave new world. Um, but when that is, I don't know. At present, the several steps I've outlined are tentative pushes in that direction, but short of the big aggregate push uh, that I've just referred to now. You know, we've been looking at how China could build that financial market critical mass that could help give it confidence to make that step you just talked about, Kevin. I was really interested in this survey I read recently of central banks that came out from a think tank that focuses on large institutions like that called OMFIF. They suggested that 30% of central banks that they surveyed plan to increase the renminbi held in their reserves over the next one to two years. And that's up from about 10% planning to hold more renminbi when they were asked in a similar survey a year ago. So it does seem like public sector capital is moving in this direction. But at the same time, we need to think about private sector capital. And we're definitely seeing an increase in foreign money going into Chinese sovereign bond markets. The question we're wondering right now is how China's policy goals, including geopolitical goals, could influence capital flows going forward. And tied to that, we saw a statement earlier this summer from Japan about security in the region. And I'd really appreciate your thoughts on how you see all these pieces coming together, the capital flows and the geopolitics in the region, particularly between Japan, China, and other countries in Asia. Um, I wish I could produce a model which um, effectively aggregated and compartmentalized these different categories of risk. I'm sure Ray's got one in his cerebral cortex, um, uh, which uh, neatly uh, dovetails uh, one element of the calculus to another. But if we've got aggregate geopolitical risk between China and the United States, well, the whole range of it's called the Taiwan plus factors that you just referred to, then you've got what I would describe as um, uh, associated uh, bilateral economic risk, which is the decoupling and supply chain equation that we've been discussing. And then you go down to the next category of risk, which is um, what I describe as domestic economic risk within China, given the impact of some of the politically driven regulatory changes, which have raised the confidence questions I touched on earlier. Uh, and then you have the quite specific shall we say, uh, financial and, and currency market risks associated with what happens if the Chinese do liberalize. This is a very complex, um, shall we say, spectrum of risk. To finish on the latter point before we then going back to the first one, on the, um, um, the danger for the Chinese system of Didi, in my judgment, but you folks will judge this better, is that the DD decision I do not think would be at all welcomed by the uh, Liu Hers of this world, or let's call it the Yi Gangs of this world, uh, or what I would describe as the uh, uh, Chinese um, financial market regulatory class uh, of individual. For the simple reason they know the system well enough to know what the confidence impact will be in the international financial community when a decision like this is taken within days of a New York Stock Exchange listing. And that therefore conveys um, a message to the world, which you'll be better able to quantify than me, about what then happens 
in the future environment, if I do take my current percentage of foreign reserves from 2% to 3% to 5% held in a renminbi to 10% to 15% or to 17%, what happens uh, if we have politically induced changes vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the exchange rate or vis-a-vis -vis, uh, other factors impacting on the integrity of those reserves? I think it triggers those sorts of reservations, which I know the PBOC crowd and the Ministry of Finance crowd and the Liu Her crowd will be deeply anxious about. So that's one box of uh, risk just to round out on that. On the other box of risk, which is going from, you know, um, uh, foreign exchange markets and currency markets through to classic geopolitical risk, I've been surprised, as you have indicated, Rebecca, by the stridency of recent statements coming out of Tokyo. Um, the Japanese, in my long experience of them over the last 35 years, uh, have always been mega cautious in the statements they make publicly about their range of China challenges. Not just because of the historical sensitivities about the war, and the level of Japanese brutality administered against China during the war, um, for which um, there was a huge legacy cost, um, but because they don't wish to unnecessarily, uh, as it were, aggravate the relationship beyond the necessary. And the necessary elements of it are what's currently happening each day of the week uh, in the air and on the water in and around Sankoku Diaoyudao in the East China Sea in the contested claim around the three or four islands which make up that group and the, around, the surrounding 200 uh, uh, mile um, uh, special economic zone uh, or exclusive economic zone, I should say. Um, and so historically, the Japanese do not comment much about this publicly. Below the radar, however, literally, it is intense and frenetic on the high seas all the time. Um, you speak with Japanese defense officials and foreign ministry officials, pulling their hair out. What are we doing next? You know, how many assets we've got to be deploying? They're increasing their sorties. What do we do to counter this, etc.? So, but that's always been contained privately and not articulated publicly. When Taro Aso recently began to talk about publicly about the need for the United States and Japan uh, to uh, join together in the defense of Taiwan. This is a major change in Japanese declaratory policy. Um, and I can only assume that this represents a degree of deep Japanese official exasperation at the intensification of Chinese military actions in the East China Sea. Um, I know the graph has been going like that for some time, but I can only assume, because it's difficult to have these conversations with the Japanese MOD on an open uh, source like this, uh, that this is a direct reaction to those sorts of uh, considerations at this time. What does it mean at the end of the day? I think it means that if in the unlikely event that you had a full explosion over Taiwan um, uh, in the years ahead between China and the United States, would Japan automatically become involved? Given this language, the probability of that occurring now is somewhat greater than was the case before, though it would still be a huge debate within Japan, given the pacifist nature of the Japanese uh, constitution uh, as it concerns Japanese uh, armed deployments beyond the physical defense of Japan. Kevin, I want to make sure I don't leave anything important out today. Are there any other touch points we should be discussing here? in terms of, let's call it um, black swan events, um, is um, uh, the recent actions over cyber, uh, uh, Microsoft, the coordinated uh, responses by the, um, uh, let's call it uh, US allies around the world, by what they said, not yet by what they have done, could well become a precursor for retaliatory actions by US, Asian and European allies in the future. Of what shape and form and type, I do not know. But that is something in our overall risk box, which frankly needs to have 
almost its own separate label. Uh, people like Dave and others well connected in Washington, uh, frankly, getting a handle on where this one is going to go over the next couple of months, I think would be a very useful thing. Um, uh, and it is where much of the activity is happening between and among governments now in their dealings uh, with China. The only other risk factor that I'd point to is this, between now and the 20th Party Congress at the end of next year, next November, which is Xi Jinping's big re-elect moment, to become effectively leader for life. Uh, if there's ever a debate between politics and economics, or politics, Chinese domestic politics and foreign policy, in the next year or so, Chinese domestic politics will always win out between now and when that happens um, at the end of next year. And so if there's any belief that, um, that somehow you know, the Chinese will more rationally see the American position on X, Y, and Z, A, B, and C, that ain't gonna happen uh, between now and next November. And the, the list of stuff I just read out before from the Wendy Sherman meeting given to her by the Chinese, uh, to me indicates exactly the tonality I expect, which is politics, China's domestic political needs first, uh, and what the rest of us may think would be the best and most rational economic course of action or foreign policy course of action or even national security course of action over the next 12 months, they're all gonna come second. Um, what's the wild card here? The wild card is if you had a big Delta outbreak in China and the vaccines, the Chinese vaccines were unable to handle it. Uh, that is a horror scenario. And it may be frankly one of the reasons why it's gonna be very difficult for foreign political leaders to find their way to Beijing easily uh, into the future because there's a real fear of what people actually are bringing into the country at the moment. And that'll hold up through until the 20th Party Congress, I think. Kevin, thank you so much for all your time and perspective today. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Rebecca. Bye.